uh, concerning the women in Southeast Asia and the family, as well as the world of the spirits and religious belief in Southeast Asia. The women of Southeast Asia during this era have been described as the most fortunate in the entire world. Although most women worked side by side with men in the fields, as in Africa, they often played an active role in trading activities. Not only did this lead to a higher literacy rate among women than among their male counterparts, but it also allowed them more financial independence than their counterparts in China and India, a fact that was noticed by the Chinese traveler Zhou Da Guan at the end of the 13th century. In Cambodia, it is the women, he said, who take charge of trade. For this reason, a Chinese arriving in the country loses no time in getting himself a mate, for he will find her commercial instincts a great asset, end quote. Although, as elsewhere, ref, well, uh, warfare was normally part of the male domain, women sometimes played a role as bodyguards. But according to Zhou Daguan, uh, women were used to protect the royal family in Angkor, as well as in kingdoms located in the islands of Java and Sumatra. While there is no evidence that such female units ever engaged in battle, they did give rise to wondrous tales of Amazon warriors in the writings of foreign travelers, such as the 14th century Muslim adventurer Ibn Battuta. One reason for the enhanced status of women in traditional Southeast Asia is that the nuclear family was more common than the joint family system prevalent in China and the Indian subcontinent. Throughout the region, wealth in marriage was passed from the male to the female, in contrast to the dowry system applied in China and India. In most societies, virginity was usually not a valued commodity in, in brokering a marriage, and divorce proceedings could be initiated by either party. Still, most marriages were monogamous, and marital fidelity was taken seriously. Uh, the relative availability of uh, cultivable land in the region may help explain the absence of joint families. Joint families under patriarchal leadership tend to be found in areas where land is scarce and individual families must work together in order to conserve resources and maximize income. With the exception of a few crowded river valleys, few areas in Southeast Asia had a high population density per acre of cultivatable land. Uh, throughout most of the area, Water was plentiful, and the land was relatively fertile. In parts of Indonesia, for example, much of the diet could be supplied by the bountiful produce of wild fruit trees, such as bananas, coconuts, mangoes, and a variety of other tropical fruits. Indian religions also had a profound effect on Southeast Asia. Traditional religious beliefs in the region took the familiar form of spirit worship and animism that we have seen in other cultures. Southeast Asians believed that spirits dwelled in the mountains, rivers, streams, and other sacred places in their environment. Mountains were probably particularly sacred since they were considered to be the abode of ancestral spirits, the place to which the souls of all the departed would retire after their death. When Hindu and Buddhist ideas began to penetrate the area early in the first millennium CE, they exerted a strong appeal among the local elites. Not only did the new doctrines offer a more convincing explanation of the nature of the universe, but they also provided local rulers with a means of enhancing their prestige and power and conferred an aura of legitimacy on their relations with their subjects. In the Javanese kingdoms and in Angkor, Hindu gods such as Vishnu and Shiva provided a new and more sophisticated veneer for existing beliefs in nature deities and ancestral spirits. In Angkor, the king's duties included performing sacred rituals on the mountain in the capital city. In time, the ritual became a state cult, uniting Hindu gods with local nature deities and ancestral spirits in a complex pantheon. This state cult, financed by the royal court, eventually led to the construction of temples throughout the country. Many of these temples hosted thousands of priests and retainers and amassed great wealth, including vast estates farmed by local peasants. It has been estimated that there were as many as 300,000 priests in Angkor at the height of its power. This vast wealth, which was often exempt from taxes, may be one explanation for Angkor's gradual decline in the 13th and 14th centuries, respectively. I do want to talk uh, a little bit about dancing Shiva. 
Uh, from the 10th to the 12th centuries, the southern kingdom of Kola excelled in the use of the lost wax technique to make portable bronze statues of Hindu gods. Bathed, clothed, and decorated with flowers, these Kola bronzes were then paraded in religious ceremonies. One of the most numerous and iconic of these bronze deities was the dancing Shiva. The statue portrays Shiva performing a cosmic dance in which he simultaneously creates and destroys the universe. While his upper right hand creates the cosmos, his upper left hand reduces it in flames. With his right foot, Shiva crushes the back of the dwarf of ignorance. Shiva's dance statue is visually convey, conveying to his followers the message of his power and of his compassion. Uh, initially, uh, the spread of Hindu and Buddhist doctrines was an elite phenomenon. Although the common people participated in the state cult and helped construct the temples, they did not give up their traditional beliefs in local deities and ancestral spirits. A major transformation began in the 11th century, however, when Theravada Buddhism began to penetrate the mainland kingdom of Pagan from the island of Sri Lanka. From Pagan, it, it spread rapidly to other areas in Southeast Asia and eventually became the religion of the masses throughout the mainland west of the Annamite Mountains. Theravada's appeal to the peoples of Southeast Asia is reminiscent of the original attraction of Buddhist thought centuries earlier on the Indian subcontinent. By teaching that individuals could seek nirvana through their own actions rather than through the intercession of the ruler or a priest, Theravada was more accessible to the masses than the state cults promoted by the rulers. During the next centuries, Theravada gradually undermined the influence of state-supported religions and became the dominant faith in several mainland societies, including Burma, Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia. In the process, however, it was gradually appropriated by local rulers who portrayed themselves as eminent Buddhas, or higher than ordinary mortals on the scale of human existence. Theravada did not penetrate far into the Malay Peninsula or the Indonesian island chain, perhaps because it entered Southeast Asia through Burma, farther to the north. But the Malay world found its own popular alternative to state religions when Islam began to enter the area in the 13th and 14th centuries. Because Islam's expansion into Southeast Asia took place for the most part after the year 1500, its emergence as a major force in the region will be discussed later. Not surprisingly, Indian influence extended to the Buddhist and Hindu temples of Southeast Asia. Temple architecture reflecting Gupta, or Southern Indian styles, began to appear in Southeast Asia during the first century CE. Most famous is the Buddhist temple at Bo Borabura, or no, Borabuddha, uh, Borabuddur in central Java. Begun in the late 8th century at the behest of a king of Silindra, an agricultural kingdom based in eastern Java, Borobudur is a massive stupa with nine terraces. Sculpted on the sides of each terrace are bas reliefs depicting the nine stages in the life of Siddhartha Gautama, from childhood to his final release from the chain of human experience. Surmounted by hollow bell-like towers containing representations of the Buddha and capped by a single stupa, the structure dominates the landscape for miles around. And that is the uh, Buddhist temple at Bora Bador. Second only to Bora Bador in technical excellence and even more massive in size are the ruins of the old capi capital city of Angkor Thom. The temple of Angkor Wat is the most famous and arguably the most beautiful of all the existing structures at Angkor Thom. Built on the model of the legendary Mount Maru, the home of the gods in Hindu tradition, it combines Indian architectural techniques with native inspiration in a structure of impressive delicacy and grace. In existence for more than 600 years, Angkor Thom serves as a bridge between the Hindu and Buddhist architectural styles. The last of its great temples, known as the Bayon, followed the earlier Hindu model but was topped with sculpted towers containing four-sided representations of a bodhisattva, searching, it is said, for souls to save. Shortly after the Bayan was built, Theravada Buddhist societies in Burma and Thailand began to create a new Buddhist architecture based on the concept of a massive stupa surmounted by a spire. Most famous, perhaps, is the Shawidagan, 
uh, Pagada in Yangon, capital of modern Burma, or uh, which is covered with gold leaf contributed by devout Buddhists from around the country. One of the great maritime feats of human history was the penetration of the islands of the Pacific Ocean by Malayo-Polynesian speaking peoples. By the year 2000 BCE, these seafarers had migrated as far as the Bismarck Archipelago, northeast of the island of New uh, Guinea, where they encountered Melanesian peoples whose ancestors had taken part in the first wave of human settlement into the region 30,000 years previously. From there, the Polynesian peoples, as they are now familiar known, continued their explorations eastward in large sailing canoes up to 100 feet long that carried more than 40 people and many of their food staples, such as chickens, chili peppers, and a tuber called taro, the source of poi. Stopping in Fiji, Samoa, and the Cook Islands during the first millennium CE, their descendants pressed onward, eventually reaching Tahiti, Hawaii, and even Eastern Island, one of the most remote sites of human habitation in the world. Eventually, one group of Polynesians, now known as the Maori, sailed southwestward from the island of Rarotonga and settled in New Zealand, off the coast of Australia. The final frontier of human settlement had been breached.